Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the CICS seminar. Uh, as a reminder, uh, the seminar next week is Professor Kuchirilakis from uh, the Technical University of Munich. And I know he will also be talking about Bayesian things and machine learning and deep learning and inverse problems. Uh, thanks for all the buzzwords on the title. Uh, so today I'm very pleased to have a good friend, uh, Professor uh, Tam Hui Tam from the University of uh, Texas at Austin. Uh, he is uh, in the process of being uh, promoted to associate professor in, in a few days, okay, or weeks. Uh, and uh, he did his PhD at MIT in uh, aeronautics and astronautics and uh, uh, postdoctoral work there and then a new postdoctoral work at uh, Austin. And uh, so today he will be speaking on uh, many different things that he is an expert. As you see there, it's a scalable, so he is one of the few people that does very large scale simulations. Uh, he is uh, massively involved now with uh, data driven models. Uh, he does a lot of PD constraint uh, work that he will refer to today. Uh, obviously, Bayesian things and inverse problems. So I'm waiting to see how you will balance all the works together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Zabraras, for inviting me to come over to share my research with you. Uh, before I start, I want to ask you a question. How many of you uh, heard or know English problems? OK, that's good. That's good. So uh, I'm, I'm, for the, those who actually haven't seen, I'm going to make sure that in one minute you understand what English problem is and why is it uh, difficult. So this is the work that I have done with my, my students um, and postdocs. Uh, two postdocs here and then my students. Uh, I'm from ISIS, uh, from uh, University of Texas, Austin. And uh, uh, I'm going to share with you all my research on Bayesian English problem in particular in, in, in the context of your data driven and how you actually can solve it in a scalable manner. Okay, this is my current group of uh, four students in uh, English problem UQ and uh, these two guys doing machine learning. And uh, I also do on, uh, work on high order finite learning method where we have three students here. Notice that they don't, uh, they refuse to be in the picture, so I decided to do UT logo there instead. Okay? Uh, so I have two postdocs here uh, currently. Um, so uh, over the years, I have been uh, getting funding from uh, standard, like right? DOE, Air Force, you know, NSF, also, you know, ExxonMobil, you know, also international collaboration that I, where I got money as well. Uh, so let, let me tell you what English problem is, right? So I started with a very easy problem that everybody knows, right? So this is W is the solution that I want to look for. U1, U2, U3 are parameter, right? This is quadratic equation everybody knows, right? So uh, fourth problem, you are given U1, U2, U3, right? Three parameters. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you ask for? You ask for a computer solution, right? And everybody knows this formula. So if I give you A, B, C, or W, U1, U2, U3, you should be able to get a solution. That's the forward problem. Everybody knows from high school, right? Or middle school. Uh, but the thing that you haven't seen, perhaps, is the English problem. Uh, in fact, I'm going to give you W, right? Let's say W equal to 2. I'm going to ask you, what are U1, U2, U3? And this is the English problem. Can somebody tell me what, what are U1, U2, U3 if the solution W is, is equal to 2? That's a lot, right? Or then none. That may be none, or that's a lot, right? So that's a, that's a, that thanks a lot. So you see, right, you, this is, inverse problem is, by itself, is not fair uh, problem in a sense, right? I, I actually, I give you one dollar, I ask you three dollars back. You see, that one information, and I get asked for three pieces of information. And that's the nature of inverse problem. On, in other words, this is the imposedness of inverse problem, where the amount of data that you have could be huge, but the actual content is much less than you are asking for, which in this case, just a simple example, where you ask for three parameters, but you have only one piece of information. So that's inverse problem, very simple, right? I hope that you can get understand what inverse problem is. Okay, so let me sw switch to PDEs, right? Inverse problem, same, same philosophy. Uh, but my equation now is a partial differential equation. You see, right? W is still my solution. If you give me U, right, the parameters, I can solve these PDEs. Right, by some methods, right? Find an element, find a problem, or, or anything that you like. We can solve these problems if you are given you. That's the fourth problem. The inverse problem is the other way around, right? You are, for example, right, you can send waves 
two, and then this is the aircraft here. The the red one is traveling way seen and hitting the aircraft, and then you know reflected back. And what you measure is the the green one, which is reflected waves. The question is what is the shape or the material of the object. So this is inverse problem, right? The fourth problem is given the shape or the material U, but the inverse problem you have measurement of W, and you are asked to figure out what it yields. Right? So, so one way to do it is to do this, right? You have observation from here. And you want, you want to try to match. This is the computer predictions, right? G, U, which is U, a, a thing that you don't know. You try to find U such that when you solve these problems, it is as close as possible to observations, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's, that's an optimization problem. Unfortunately, this is, a, like I said, this is a useful problem because the number of information that you observe typically is less than what you are asked for. You want to ask for a distribution of the, the whole material or the shape of the, the object. Uh, typically you have to ask some regularization. So that's, that's, uh, that's how you, one way to mitigate the, the problem of inverse problem, to regularize it so that we can solve it, right? So that you have a unique solution instead of many solutions that uh, some of you already mentioned. Okay, so, so that's the inverse problem. Now, so what we want to do is actually not just symbol, you know, giving you back, oh, okay, this is the shape of the object, or this is the solution of your inverse problem, u1, u2, u3, right? Uh, in, in practice, the, the measurement that you have data is limited, right? Also, you can have a noise in, in the measurements devices, and that's, that's well known, right? You can never make a perfect the equipment to measure the, the, uh, the data. So the question is that how can you actually incorporate the uncertainty in the, in the adequacy, right? In, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in complete number of observations or the, the noises. So we, we do it in a Bayesian context. So some of you here do doing Bayesian, so the, the, the other one don't worry about it. So you can look at the Bayesian in, in this sense, right? You take a lock of the posteriors for those who do a Bayesian. Otherwise, this is exactly what I showed you previously, right? You try to match the data and actually you also regularize, right? Because if you would doubt this, this is a UPO problem, you cannot solve it. Okay, so what are the challenges in, in this uh, inverse problem? There are three key players in the inverse problem. First, data. Right? The data can be big, depends on your application. For us, I'm going to show you later where we do seismic inversions, right? where you have a seismometer listen to the Earth's movement right? uh, every, every milliseconds, and you have a huge amount of data every, every minute and every day. Right? So this is a huge uh, 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 the, uh, matrix, right? this is a huge matrix. And uh, you are asked to, to, to solve for this uh, problem. When you have a huge amount of data, you have problem with I.O., right? parallel computing, and for us, when we do like AD or, or adjoint technique, you have problem with, with the uh, uh, bandwidth, right? You know that computing system in the future, or even currently, is not uh, a computing bound, but it's actually memory bound. And if you have a huge amount of data, you have problems there, right? The latency. Uh, the second uh, uh, challenge in the inverse problem is a W, right? So notice that this is a PVE. So you, you cannot solve it analytically using you know, separation of variable, right? That's, you are lucky that you can solve, but uh, in general, you have to discretize these PDEs on, on the mesh, or, or somehow solve these PDEs, right? And in order to resolve the physics, right, you're, you need to discretize in, in the fine mesh or in somehow, right, in, in enough basic function in order to resolve W. And as, as a matter, as a result, solving these PDEs, right, uh, with a very fine W or in very accurate W can take a long time for even one solve, right? For us, in the Bayesian context, you have to go through some kind of MC MC technique because at the end of the day, you got a posterior distributions, right? For those who don't know, don't worry about that, right? You get a solution which is your probability densities and you have somehow to, 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 uh, to investigate that probability density, right? Be using sampling technique and each sample requires uh, a forward solve. And if the forward, each of them is too expensive, which I'm gonna show you in a second, then this problem become, you know, problematic, right? And then uh, the third one is uh, U. The, 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 the third key player is U, which is the parameter that you want to invert for. So again, U can be a function in general, and, and you need to discretize it, right? In Fourier's base, or, or discretize it on the mesh. And uh, you typically run into the high dimensional parameter space, right? It depends on how you discretize the parameters. And you know if you work with MCMC or if you heard about the curse of dimensionality, right? The higher dimension, the more exponential work. Even though you increase the dimension linearly, the amount of work that is required typically increase exponentially. 
right? And, and that's, these are three uh, challenges. And I'm going to show you in this talk. I actually have a problem, right? Because I said, oh, should I go to a deep subject in a very deep, or I go shallow, but I'm going to go over many uh, subjects so that, you know, you can see the big features. So I decided to do it in between, right? Some of them I go shallow, explain you the idea behind the method. Some of them I go a little bit, little bit deeper, right? And I avoid uh, on the mathematical theorem behind, actually I show you only one theorem, which I think uh, interesting, right? The rest I'm gonna hide on the mathematical theory behind. So, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna tackle these uh, three issues. In particular, here's uh, my, my agenda. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you how I'm actually gonna solve the uh, uh, high dimensional uh, data space problem in the context of English problem, right? Not, not in the context of computer science. High dimensional data in our context is different. Uh, and then how to deal with the parameter that space or you, right? Uh, the, the curve dimensionality, how do we deal with that? I'm gonna show you a few approaches. And then uh, how you, now you also have the high dimensional state. Remember the solving PD is expensive. How do you actually cut down the, the, the cost of solving PDs and in particular in the context of English problem as a whole? And then I'm going to show you some particle approaches. So actually, I did some work on, on MCMC, isolating MCMC technique, but I'm not going to talk about that here, right? Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about some particle approach, right? Where we borrow sequential Monte Carlo and, and data assimilation technique, and, and we're going to use it to, to solve a Bayesian inverse problem without doing MCMC, right? Or avoid MCMC almost completely. And then, and then I'm going to show you how we actually uh, adapt U, UQ uncertainty to adapt uh, to make the solution better in the context of uh, medical imaging. And if you have time, I'm going to talk about a little bit of new statistical. You know, Bayesian is actually gold standard out there. But we have a new technique uh, um, that actually better in some sense, right? Uh, it depends on how you look at it. I'm going to tell you why is it could be better um, uh, in later. And then some conclusions and future work. So that, that's the point. So let me start with, with data, right? Machine learning data is uh, the first word, like, like Professor Bauer said, right? So let, let's see how we can uh, deal with the high dimensional data in the context of invert problem. So uh, what we want to do is to uh, have a method, to desire a method that work with sub, right, subspace of data. I actually I talked to some of the students here, uh, right? The question is, can you work with a small piece of map data, right? Yet, I want to obtain a reasonable invert solution and at the same time, I reduce the number of PD solves. Remember that each PD solve is, is a problem here, right? Unlike the, the imaging uh, community or, or computer science community where they don't see PD, PDEs, we have PDEs here. We try to reduce or uh, to, to minimize the number of PD solves, right? So can we do this, right? And it turns out the answer is actually positive if we we do this one, at least, right? This is one way to do it. So the detail is not important. Let me actually point, one, point two boxes here, right? Um, this is the uh, misfit that I showed you before. We call it a misfit, right? This is a computer prediction, and this is actual observation, and this is a regularization, right? Forget about this one. We're not going to touch, touch this one. And notice that I said that this guy, high dimensions, uh, right? This can be a big matrix. Not only very tall, but also fat matrix as well. Could be, right? So uh, uh, the, the, in between, we do some stochastic programming. There's a theory behind it. But let, let's not go into detail. But let's actually, this is actually the approximation. And let, let us actually talk about this one. Compare, compare the, the green box and the blue box, right? The, this regularization is the same. The only difference is the, the uh, sigma matrix here. And the sigma matrix, right, each column is a random vector. Right? And, and this sigma matrix is the dimension capital N and little n. Capital N is original dimension of, of the original data, right? Could be high. N is a number of, of, uh, of random projections, right? So basically, if you look at this one, if you do projection before in linear algebra, right? There's it, nothing more than project. I project the original high dimensional data, capital N dimension into the little n dimension here, right? And the, the theory behind is actually Monte Carlo. And if you know Monte Carlo, you said, oh, what, what is good about it? Because you know, right? Uh, MCMC can give you the big error, right? And it turns out, it turns out that, of course, if n is less than n, right, even though you make an error, that is fine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one, I'm gonna show you the next theorem showing that even though you make an error by projecting high dimensional data stay into a low dimensional data space, you are fine, right? In particular, this, this is a theorem. The important, the, the detail, I'm not gonna go into detail, but let me tell you the idea behind the, or the result. What does this theorem imply? This theorem says the following. 
if you can find a solution in the reduced data dimension, right? The, the solution that you work with reduced data, right? And if that solution is morose satisfying uh, solution, so what does morose uh, discrepancy principle say? The morose discrepancy discrepancy principle says that you don't want to match this one to zero, right? This is your observation, and you know that there's noise in there. And this is your computer prediction. You don't ma want to match them exactly because if you match them exactly, you overfit, right? Or you match the noise, and you, you don't get a solution. You get actually something, you know, look weird. So Morozov said, okay, you solve until the difference between these two guys is about the same order of the noise, and you should stop, right? So you should stop early in your optimization, if you wish. And this theorem says that if your reduced solution satisfy the Morozov discrepancy principle for the reduced cost, right? Remember, this is the reduced cost. Then it is also a Morozov discrepancy solution of the original cost, right? In other words, you can work with the very low dimension of data, you get a solution, meaningful solution. That meaningful solution in the reduced space is also a meaningful solution in the original um, space. Right? That, that's a key measure that I want to, to pass here, right? And, and, and with high probability, we, we are successful, right? Okay, let, let me do some demonstration here. That's the message. But now let, let's do some uh, examples. So here, right, toy example where I have, this is the exact uh, yield that I want to recover. And my problem, the, the, the data dimension 1,333. Okay, and, and this is the solution with 31 random di uh, uh, directions. So, and, and notice that I haven't talked about what is sigma, right? It's just a random matrix, but actually you can do very sparse random projections. So here we do 65, 7% sparsity random projection with 31 uh, reduced dimension. Uh, you know, you say, oh, we don't get much, right? You get something here. How about increase it a little bit? You start seeing this, the solution here, right? And if you agree a little more, you actually can already see the solution quite well. Okay, of course, in the eyeball known, if you're thinking about if you want to see where, whether there's an oil reservoir in here, so this may be uh, good, right? So the, the point is that the point is that you can reduce all the magma magnitude in data that they direction, and yet you still can get a, a meaningful solution, which is justified by the previous theorem that I show you. Okay, and another important point that I want to, to you to keep in mind, right? The theorem says that. The review dimension, which is little n, is independent of the original dimension n. Okay? So you can reduce a very high dimension of data state into a small. Of course, you have a low bound. In fact, I don't show you here. There's a few other theorems that I don't show. But what I'm trying to tell you is there's a low bound. You cannot go below, right? Which is minimal, uh, which is reasonable, right? I mean, you cannot go on the way to one dimension, and hopefully you still can get a solution, which is, doesn't make sense, right? So there's a low bound that you can go, but that low bound, does not depend on the original dimension. That's the that's key. Independent original dimensions. Okay, let me show you a, a 3D example where you, you, in this case we have 2474 dimensions in the data, and if you project in the 50 random uh, direction with you know 67% sparsity, you already see we recover something here, right? If you increase a little bit, right, you already recover almost uh, the, exactly the, the same, at least in the eyeball norm. Um, so and again, all the magnitude reductions. Uh, okay, so I have shown you that, you know, theoretically and also numerically that we can reduce high dimension of data in the context of inverse problem. You work with a small subspace, you get a minimum solution, right? So the next thing that I want to accomplish here numerically, this one we cannot prove, right? But remember that I also want to try to reduce number of PD solves because PD is actually is the most expensive thing that I, I have to deal with in this context of PD constraint optimized or inverse problem. So this is if you use the full direction, full dimension, right? And you have a lot of trial here. This is on average you need two thousand four hundred twenty-three PD socks, right? You solve the PD two thousand four hundred times. But this is the many way to do random projection. And this one I'm going to show you, right? Even ninety-five or ninety-nine percent sparsity. All of these, you cut half the number of PD socks. Okay, you do the dimension, the dimension of the data, and at the same time you cut down the number of PD solved, and yet you still can get the reasonable solution, right? Remember that that, that we only show the, the previous theorem. Okay, that's a 2D, 3D. We can observe the same thing, but not much, right? Because you know this problem is quite easy. Uh, that's what we, that what we we think. So we still have reduction in the number of PD solves, but not much as in, in the 2D. Okay, so. 
So hopefully, right, uh, I have shown you a way, well, of course we can talk more in detail if you are interested, a way to reduce the dimension of the data to, to, to get a meaningful solution for inverse problem at the same time reduce, reduce the number of, uh, of PE solves. Okay, so the second um, uh, topic that I want to go through is uh, how, how about high dimensional parameter space? What do you want to do with it? Um, let me show you first uh, an example where uh, we do an assignment inversion with many people, right? But then this is back in my uh, uh, research scientist days. Um, so the, the forward PDE is the, the left hand side, right? This is the elastic wave equation where you want to invert forward for C. And this is the earthquake in Japan that I showed here. This is Japan here, and that's how we, we simulate the earthquake on the whole Earth, right? With large scale, I'm going to show you in a second. I'm talking to to Alex and a couple, of, and also Daniel. Uh, he talked. He asked me how much, how big uh, the the problem can be. I'm going to show you in a second. This is the full blown earthquake. So we want to, to invert for the parameter here, which you see. We have the observation on the Earth. Okay. So so for the forward problems. Um, this back then, eight years ago, we did it like this high order of method, don't worry about that. But uh, what my main point is that this problem I have, we have 9.3 billion degree of freedom, and this is a parallel efficiency on the way to 262,000 processors. And we got 71% uh, uh, percent, uh, uh, parallel efficiencies. And on, uh, if you increase the solution order, which give you a better solution, more accurate solution, of course, more expensive, but you can get to uh, almost 100% of a parallel efficiency, right? That's the beauty of high order method, which I'm not gonna talk about here, uh, right? Okay, so that's the forward. So let's actually try to do inverse problem. How to quantify uncertainty, remember that I, I told you, right? We not only want to give you a solution, but we also want to give you how much confident I am, right? That in the solution that I give you. For example, tomorrow it's rain. What is the percentage of rain tomorrow? That's what I also want to do, right? So um, um, I'm gonna, the detail is not important here. Again, this is the, the posterior covariance, right? So I'm not gonna go into detail. What I'm trying, the, the main point that I'm gonna talk in this, this slide is, is that we have a way to estimate uncertainty, right, in an efficient way, where we do lowering approximation, randomized uh, singular variable with position, right? The randomized technique is uh, very successful in the sense that you can do in completely in parallel and with high probability you are successful, right? High probability, what, what is high? 99.9% probability that you, you are success. So you, you, you can do you can the same trick from linear algebra and also randomized linear algebra that allow you to can estimate the, the, the uncertainty in an efficient way. The detail is not important, but I actually wanted to, to give you a message that we can do it. And here's, here's here what we do for quite large scale uh, problem, where we have 1.07 million number of parameters, U. Remember, U is what we are going to work for. And it's dimensioning 1.07 million. And the W, remember that the solution that the PD is, is a 633 million. Uh, uh, degree of freedoms. And uh, with 1,000 seconds, with 2,400 time step, you see that even on 64,000 processor, it requires one minute for the PD solve. Just one PD solve, take one minute on 64,000 processors. Okay, so uh, the true, we do synthetic, right? Uh, on, the, uh, on the white dot here are the where we do observation, synthetic observation. These are earthquake sources. Uh, and the true is, is this, right? This is a, 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 a level, right? Actually, this is 65 kilometer inside the Earth. That's how it looked like the, the, uh, the synthetic thing that we want to recover. And this is the map point, which is, you can think of some, let's see, the determinist, deterministic solutions, optimization solutions. You see that we can recover things quite well, right? Around the, the uh, close to the measurements, you actually can recover quite well, but for the way where we don't have observation, of course, you don't hope to, to get uh, very well, right? That's, that's obvious because you don't have information there. And uh, not only we want to give you the solution, this is what we believe a solution, but we also give you the, the uncertainty, right? And remember, this is the posterior uncertainty. This is the prior uncertainty where we don't know anything. We put the uniform, almost uniform prior uncertainty. In fact, this is a Gaussian uh, prior. This is the uncertainty originally. And this is the data information that you obtain from the data. And when the data comes, right, then you get the lower uncertainty. You see that this one, blue, is actually less and red is big. So when the, when the data come, you have less uncertainty. This is the posterior uncertainty where it says that you have a low uncertainty in the North America region, but in, in the South you have higher uncertainty. And uh, again, because we don't have observation out there. Um, okay, so uh, that's one way to do it, to you lowering approximations, 
right, to determine where which parameter space dimension is important to estimate the uncertainty and to get the solution in, in, a, in a you know scalable manners. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to show you is actually this is an interesting approach. It's a right, reduction approach or active subspace approach that I did with uh, Paul Constantin well, now at UC uh, Boulder. Okay, so what is the idea? Remember, this is the misfit, right? The, uh, the computer uh, uh, computer prediction. This is observation, and this is a data misfit. What do we do? We construct a covariant matrix, right? Basically, the outer outer product of the, the of the f, uh, the gradient of f, and we do uh, uh, eigenvalue decomposition or SVD decompositions, okay? And then it turns out that lambda is the uh, single value here, the lambda i, lambda i. In in fact. This has a meaning form, uh, uh, it has a meaning. It is the average projection of the gradient on the, um, uh, the i singular vectors, right? In other words, lambda i, the bigger the lambda i is, right, the more important the i direction is because you have more your gradient. The, what is the gradient? The gradient is the direction where your function changes most, right? So the bigger the lambda uh, i, then the, the more your gradient align with the, the, uh, the w i a single value of uh, directions. OK, so well, and, and if, right, if we notice this uh, a meaningful, then we can truncate. We can decompose our covariance matrix right, into two parts. With this one with low or small lambda i. Right? A small lambda i means that your gradient doesn't have anything to do with the direction. You should, you should care, right? And lambda one is the, the one that has all the eigenvalues that's large, which of course tell you in that in this direction your gradient are uh, actually or most likely in this direction. So you should keep it that right, the right direction where your function change most. Okay, when you do that, you can decompose your solution again. This is I'm sorry, there's a little mismatch in, in the notation. This is u, right? But let, let's do x now. So you can decompose your solution into two parts, which is an active. Right? The active part is corresponding to the eigenspace that is corresponding to the high eigenvalues, and then the inactive part with the small eigenvalues. Okay, and what is the use for this one? We can do then, we can decompose our probability, all right, or the parameter space into two, right? The parameter space now decompose into the active and inactive. Okay? And then you can approximate your posterior density, right, in, in two parts. The first part corresponds to the active, right? Which is look similar to the usual, right? This is the usual inverse problems, right? This is the misfit and this is the prior. And the other part, which is inactive, which is Z, inactive, which we hope is in high dimension. And in fact, I'm going to show you an example. Typical, typical inverse problem, the inactive dimension is high, right? But the active dimension is low. And remember that the higher dimensions the Monte Carlo technique, because of the cost of dimensionality, the amount of work increased most likely exponentially. This method automatically pick out the active subspace, which is small, and then you do MCMC on the small subspace. And then the inactive, and then hopefully large subspace, you do direct sample from the other prior, right, without solving PDEs. This one you solve PDEs, but in the low dimensions. And therefore, at the end of the day, we hope that we use a small amount of samples, and yet we still can recover the English problem, right? Because what we do is actually we put all the work on the low dimensional but active subspace actually dictated by the data, right? Remember that we have a data here, data here. Okay, so uh, let me give you an example here uh, where we, we cook up an example in just 100 dimensions. Right? And this is if you do MCMC on the full dimension, so 100 dimension, this is what you get in, in the two dimensional x1 and x2. But this is the active subspace. And it turns out that we, we, if you use this approach, the, the method pick, uh, pick, out, pick out two dimensional important, the rest 98 dimension is not important. And then here's the, the, the gain. If you do MCMC on 100 dimensions, for which only two dimensions are active, right? Though MCMC does not mix well, even 10 to the fifth, right? That's it, 10 million, uh, 10,000 uh, samples, right? Six, actually, 60,000 samples. But with the active subspace approach, you see that even on the order one, you already mix very well. Because again, right, we only do MCMC on the very low dimension. Because if you do MCMC at high dimension, it's confused. We do not mix well. 
But if you can figure out what, which are the dimensions that are important, then you should do MCMC on that, right? The uninformed direction, you should do direct sampling. And then you, you, you gain a lot. So for example, here, you can see, right? If you look at this, you say, oh, I mean, even 10 samples is good enough for the estimation, right? Because it's mixed already very well. You see that it jump up and down here. But this guy you will not be able to do it. Okay, so uh, I have looked at the high dimensional data. I showed you a way to uh, reduce the dimensions of the data to get this sort of reasonable English problem and at the same time reduce the number of PD solves. And I have shown you two methods to deal with high dimension uh, in the parameter space. The first one is you lowering approximation to do directly no, no, no explicit dimensional reduction, but implicit because when you lower an approximation behind the scene, right, to estimate uncertainty. And the second method that I have just shown you is to do active subspace, right, or model reduction to find out which dimension is actually important or informed by your data, right? And then we just focus doing MCMC in this low dimension subspace, which requires much less sample. Right? Then do an MCMC on very high dimensional, where we don't know, you know, idea, we have no idea which dimension is important, and then MC just jumping around and take forever to mix, right? So that's the that's second approach. Now, that, I think this, this, this is interesting, so I'm going to share, share you one, one, one way to do double reduction in terms of reducing the, the data, uh, uh, I'm sorry, reducing the parameter and also the, the state. Okay, this is uh, what first we, we are in engineering, right? Uh, actually, I am. So when I look at this, uh, look at this one. This one is the exact solution that we want to invert for, right, the U, right, the true. And this is observations. And if you solve the problem, this is what you get, right? And obviously you don't, cannot recover this one because your observation is here, right? There's almost no hope, especially if you do an elliptic problem, that's almost impossible to recover this one. And if you look at this one, you say, oh, you know, you spend most of your work doing something that's almost useless here. You don't get anything there. You have so much uncertainty and high error there, right? Then why should I deal with this one? And even for the uh, SIMIC, large-scale SIMIC inversion problem, you see also, right? I mean, only this region is useful to re recover, but you do a lot of work here, but you don't get anything. The, the uncertainty is very high here, that I showed you before, right? So there's not match here. And this is another one that I happens to show you, which I did before for electromagnetic scattering problem, where I have an observation here. I can recover the red one, which is the Z one, and the, 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 the blue one, which is the MCMC approximation that we do. You see that we can re recover the front very well, but the back is not very well, right? So let's pose the question if there's a huge amount of the domain or the portion, portion of the domain where we know that we have a high uncertainty and very huge error. Why should we spend work, right, doing work to recover the region, right? Can we just remove this? That's, that's not a question that I ask. Uh, and the answer is yes, right? Here, let me show you one way to do it. Again, so this is the observation just to show you a, 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 a cartoon here. This is observations. What we want to do is, oh, okay, this is an observation and I'm going to tell you where to truncate, where to cut the domain in a second. But right now, let's assume that we can cut right here, right? We want to solve the English problem in a much smaller domain because this piece of the domain is well informed by the data. This one is not. You have, you're going to get a lot, a lot of error and uncertainty anyway. Why should you spend here? Let's throw it away. Okay? So how do you throw it away? So uh, this is how you do it. You're going to, no, no, this is the, the PDE, the original PDE is in this domain. Right? And you immediately, when I say I cut the domain and throw it away, you immediately ask me a question. What question that you should ask? What question? Remember that the PD is original imposed on big domain where you have boundary condition, you have everything. Now I said, oh no, I'm gonna throw this piece away. What's the problem here? Or, or what should I care about? What should I be careful here when I throw that away? Exactly, very good. You are very good, right? So what, what's the boundary condition here? <laughs> um, so here's the idea. We're gonna do English problem for the parameter here and also battery at the same time. We, we don't know the battery. We invert for the battery and the parameter here at the same time. And some of you say, oh, what's the point? Oh, there's a point here. Because that you have a huge amount of parameter here, right? So basically you compact a huge amount 2D. In this case, like look at this one. This is a two-dimensional parameter space now compact or contract in one-dimensional parameter space here. Right? So I want to recover the battery condition along this line and the parameter in here. Right? And at this, 
by doing that, I, I save a lot of you know, amount of work here because there's a huge amount of parameter and also the, the forward saw. Remember that the forward saw, which is the PVs. If you do it originally, you saw in the full domain. Now I saw the PVs on a little domain. So I cut down the, the amount of work for the PVEs and also the sending, right? Because now I have a much less number of the degree of freedom, right? I have some additional here, but this additional is nothing compared to the thing that where I truncate, right? And of course, I, I, for this way, we do a DT and map. Don't worry about that, right? There's, there's a there's a boundary condition that I need to, uh, to, to invert, but again, this is one dimension. So the key idea is to invert, not only for the parameter in the domain that you're interested, but also invert for the boundary condition, right? Uh, and and that's, that's the key idea. Okay, uh, and I will show you that, uh, of course, the question you ask are where. I'm gonna show you how do you uncertainty estimation to know where, where, where you should throw the thing away, okay? Okay, so uh, uh, let, let me show a couple of examples. Uh, here, remember that I have measurement here, I'm going to truncate arbitrary like that. I just cut here, cut here, I asked my postdoc to do it, right? To cut here, recover this boundary condition along this and the parameter here. And you see that we do pretty well, right, compared to this one. And we actually completely don't do anything in here because we throw it away, right? And, and uh, another example just shows of just to eyeball norm here, arbitrary here, when we cut it to arbitrary matters. And you see that actually this one is actually even closer in some sense compared to this one, right? This one is more, you know, circular than this one. And why is that? Well, because now you have a less number of parameters to invert for. So uh, intuitively you, have, you should get a better solution, right? That's the reason why it was probably difficult because you have so many parameters to invert for, right? And you can think about, you know, if you have so many knots to tools, you confuse, right? Especially those who do machine learning nowadays, right? How many layers that you do? How many neurons on, on each layer? How many patches? If you have so many knots to tune, this is very complicated. How about if you have only one knot, right? Here, instead of having so many knots to tune, I re restrict my cell now in a smaller domain. It's easier to, to, reco to recover, right? Um, okay, so this is another example where I have 3D, we have observation here. If you do on a full domain, this is what you get. But if you truncate, right? If you truncate into a little cube here, you recover this one better than the, the full domain again, right? You are less confused. The optimization itself is less confused. Okay, so this is a, a more interesting example where my student uh, is a lady who actually loves cat, right? This is OMG cat, right? Oh my God, cat. Uh, so this is what she wants to recover, and this is the observation, okay? And if this is the map point that you, you do on the full dimensions, right? And here, let me show you how we actually wear the truncate. We saw, remember that we do low rate approximation in, in the sounding uh, uh, case. We do low rate approximation to estimate uncertainty. You see that this is uncertainty. The uncertainty is actually high here. This is high uncertainty, low uncertainty, right? So the high uncertainty region, we're going to cut it. We estimate uncertainty and cut out the region where the uncertainty is high, right? And then we, we do Bayesian sampling on, on the, the low dimension here. Right? And you see that we actually recover in this, like the mouth, the, the nose here, better than this one. And let me show you some extra numbers. If you do the full, right, this is the true. If you do even the true uh, map, DTM map, this is how the number of PD saw that you need. For us, there's many ways to do the, uh, the truncated right? uh, optimizations. You see that this um, approach takes um, less than the number of uh, PD saw compared to using even the true DTM map. Uh, don't worry about DTM maps. If you do the full domain, right, you take 14,000 PD solves. For us, we own 2,000 or 3,000 PD solves. Um, and, and here's actually an interesting result. If you do full domain, right, this is the, the mean and this is low and high, right, uncertainty. And you see that you don't get much. And uh, let me, this is actually uh, uh, many methods here, and you see that we can recover things very well compared to the full thing again, right, because you are low dimension. Okay, so I have shown you uh, how we can somehow, right, based on the, the fact that even though the data has, you have a lot of data, but it's kind of limited information, as soon as you figure out the, where this, the limited information and the uncertainty, you should throw away part that you actually have high uncertainty, right? You should not spend work on that, right? Because not only you take a lot of work to do, but also uh, you can get a confused solution. Remember that the, the solution doesn't look good on full dimension. Okay, so uh, another approach that I'm gonna talk about now is, is the uh, 
particle approach. Like, like I mentioned to you before, we did a lot of research on MCMC, accelerating MCMC technique, where if you do random work with troublous hastings, we also do with Hessian and gradients, and also third order derivative, where we actually can go around, a lot around the curvatures, right? We only sample in the high dimension, high probability region. We don't try to go and do the sample into a low probability region. But I'm not going to show you here. I'm going to show you in a different approach that avoid MCMC because MCMC, as you know, is very, very expensive, right? Um, okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, this square, we don't, don't go there. I don't go into details. But I, I'm going to show you the idea. The idea is the following. I start from the particle. This is borrow the sequential multi uh technique that Professor Zavaras has some work on that, right? So I start from a sample from the posterior. This is, no, this is the prior density. This is the posterior density, which is complicated, right? You see that two modes, and that's also very skilled. The question is, can I start from some sample or particle of the prior, right? Can I move the particle to the, 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 the posterior samples, right? Not only I want to move, but I, can, I also want to show in the limit the particle is distributed by the posteriors. Right? Because that's what we want. You don't just want just simply move around and hopefully things go well, right? We can have a rigorous result to show that actually the particle here actually is distributed by the, the posterior, right? In the limit, when the number of particles goes to infinity. Okay, so you see that I start from here, I move in the intermediate. Going directly from here to here is very tough. Right? Now, so instead of doing that, we go through a few thick, right here, the tempering thing, that uh, we do sequential Monte Carlo technique, but it's in a tempering technique, right? Because we don't have a, the, the sequential nature, because we have a posterior, which is one single posterior. How do we do it? We do a tempering, right? We go from the prior and do something closer to the prior, but also a little bit to the, the posterior direction. You see that, right? And then more and more and more closer to the posterior. And then we move the particle along. Okay, and how do we do it? In each step to move particle, we solve a Monge Cantorovic optimal transfer problem. And this is a linear optimization problem. Right? If you do Monge problem, you solve non-linear. But we do Cantorovic Monge optimization problem to move particle from here to here. There, you only need to solve an optimization problem, linear optimization, but high dimensions. Okay, and we know how to do it, but there are methods to do it. Same one, actually I mentioned to some of our colleagues here, um, who actually does uh, optimization, I think Daniela, I think, or, or Alex, I, I forgot who did that. But, but uh, we do optimal transfer uh, to move the particle around, and we prove that actually is, is satisfied. Okay, let me give you some example to see. Okay, it's a toy example where you see here we have one million uh, number of optimization variables, and this is, this is our distribution. The red one is the, 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 uh, the exact, right? And we start from the, the prior, uh, 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 which is the, the which is the, the, the Gaussians, and here you see, you see that we can actually not only we can get to the, the posterior with multimodal, but we can also do well compared to you know if you do compare important samples. In fact, our method is good in the important samples, right? But we see that using optimal transport on top of that and tempering technique, sequential Monte Carlo, we can actually capture the most uh, right. Uh, and with multimodal, which is you know quite hard, if you're thinking about uh, uh, MCMC, right? if you do MCMC, you may stop here forever until you can move to here. But this method, you can move uh, particle around. And this is a little bit, uh, uh, the, actually, this is also well known difficult, right? Because you have a skill, and you see that there's a much. These two modes much separate, and then I change this parameter a little bit, and they much. See right? And this is the MC. This is the important sampling, but us. This is our uh, approach uh, where we can do better, more efficient, right? And, and this one is uh, similar, right? This is an ensemble transform that we did, but this is uh, you know, um, the route that we started, which is uh, an important sampling, is, which is not very good. Uh, and this actually clearly, is, you see that actually this is not good at all. Here we have 16 million the, the optimization variables, the linear optimization, linear programming, where we can solve very quickly. Okay, so uh, for the last five minutes or, or so, let me, uh, let me show you how we this is actually not very well explored in the uh, Bayesian uh, inverse problem where adapt adaptivity, right? So we, you notice that I start with, I discretize the solution in W is, is, the, is the state, right? And it's also U, the, the solution in U. Use the parameters. And you know that we have a limited amount of data, even though we have a huge amount of data, they, they, they may contain a limited amount of information, right? And we want to recover U from these data. Right? 
So for one can say, okay, how about I distribute u? Remember that I have distribute u in the same conversion, one million, but the state, which is w, 630 million. Why should I do so? Because, because the parameters need to take with them a data, right? So if, if you think that if you think that your data has six of a million dimensions, then the parameter should not have more than a million dimensions, right? Because that's dictated by the data. Okay. So my our question now is that okay, it can easily to put down a mesh for the parameter and then whatever the dimension you try to come up with a way to do reduction like I showed you previously, active such state or lower approximation. But a more interesting question is that can we somehow adapt the dimension of the parameters? Right here, based on the data you have, right? In the context of inverse problem. And this is the one that I'm gonna show you, you next now. So this is actually what we, we work on. We have a project with the Mexican uh, uh, collaborators where I'm funded from Texas side and, and my collabor collaborator is, is funded by, by the Mexico side. Uh, where we want to, you see this is the lever, right? This is the cut, right? In our body, this is the back of, this is the back of, of our body, this is the tummy, right? Uh, so you see that this is the red one means that the stiffness of, of the, 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 the lever, this is very high stiffness. This, this, this one is actually uh, a big problem with the, 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 uh, the, uh, the lever because the, the lever is stiff here, right? Okay, so uh, what we want to do is that we want not only to do the inverse problem of uncertainty, but we want to do it in an adaptive manner because we want to recover these in, in a very, very high resolution manner. Okay, that's the goal. But let me show you uh, first the toy problem that we did. Okay, again, we do estimation uncertainty. Right, again, this is important. We can, when you have estimation uncertainty, then you see this is region. This region have a low uncertainty. This is high uncertainty. What should you do? You start from a very coarse mesh of the parameter, and then you refine the mesh around the region where you have less uncertainty. Why? Because these are the regions that you have more confidence. Right? And you should make it resolve better and better. But in the region where you have a less confidence, you shouldn't do anything. You should coarsen your mesh. Or you should either remove it or you shouldn't put a lot of mesh point there right? to re resolve it because there's a lot of error there. Okay, that's the idea behind our approach. We're going to refine the mesh, the primary space mesh, where the uncertainty is low. Right? And high uncertainty, we don't. And let me show you this. Is, this original map is this one, this big, original uniform mesh, and this is after two, two iterations of adaptation, third, fourth, and fifth iterations. Okay, and then here's the, here you have, you see the, the, the recovery. This, after one iteration of the mesh refinement, this is the, the, the solution that you get, this is what you believe, how your lever look like, right? Uh, but you see it very blurry and very, very, very not good <laughs> at all. But after we find a mesh a little bit, in the second iteration, you already see a very well uh, thing, right? And after the third iteration, four iterations, right? Then you get, get a better, better uh, image of, of what you reconstruct. And, and this, what we believe, is, is, uh, should be the way, right? You shouldn't start, well, of course, <coughs> both ways are okay, but instead of starting from the high dimensional parameter space and then try to reduce, here we adaptively, based on the information of data, try to come up with what, where you actually should have a parameters to, evoke, to invert for, right? Where you shouldn't, or you put less here, right? Okay, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, 50 already. Let me tell you uh, prif, the prep idea of the, the method that I, I'm gonna uh, show here, but I'm not gonna, uh, uh, I don't have, I, I, did, I didn't prepare any slides for this method, right? Uh, it's gonna be another talk. But let me tell you the idea. Um, why do I add the regularization? Let me ask you a question. Why should I add the regularization in the inverse problem? Why? Remember that we have a, we are on the inverse for, for u, we want u to u3, right? Or u. And then I add the regularization. Why is that? Why, why should I do it? Huh? Noise and observation. Noise and observation, one thing, and then what else? Ill condition. Ill condition, yes. Yeah, ill condition, that's right. Uh, also, right, these two together, ill condition, that means you have a, a small amount, piece of data, but you want to recover more. Remember that unfair, I give you one dollar, I ask you for three dollars back, right? So, so that problem, if you look at it, if you do thinking about minimization, that, this is back to high school, right? You know that a parabola have a unique solution, right, of minimize, right? By adding the real realization, what do we do? 
we make the problem more look more like parabola, right? Right, because the misfit y of zero minus g, the u positive met, met that guy doesn't look like a parabola, and the, and the regularization in u minus u zero square, and that's a parabola, right? Why does it work? Because you make your problem look more like parabola, right? And we know in high school the problem is if it's a parabola, then you have a unique solution. The, the u positive done solved. Okay, so first that's intuition behind uh, uh, regularization, but then here's the issues. When you put down parabola or put realizations, you realize everywhere in the parameter space. Ideally, you want to realize the uninformative parameters. Remember that I have an active subspace and an inactive subspace, right? The active subspace is dictated by the data, the inactive is not, right? Ideally, you want to put realization on the inactive subspace. You don't want to put a realization on the, on the active uh, subspace dictated by the data. Because you, you smear out the solution. You mess up with the solutions, right? But in, in, in practice, you don't know where, right? So typically, when you put regularization, you regularize everywhere. Okay, hopefully you regularize less in the data dimensions, in form dimensions, okay? So this new technique, where we go back all the way from, you know, some of you are math students here, we go all the way to the measure theory. This is integration formula, all the way to measure theory from, you know, day one, and develop, right? Uh, a statistical approach where we hope, right, and actually we prove, at least for a linear case, whatever you start with the prior, right, our framework completely remove the prior, right, on the dimension or on the parameter space that is actually did the base by data. Whatever you mean the prior, no matter what it is, the method automatically remove the realization in the active subspace. And it's also act on the in that case, and that's the case. And in, in, in for our approach, we show at least linear case. We can show that is true. Okay, I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, but uh, but that's that's a uh, very interesting, right? It's a, it's a new approach. It's not a, not Bayesian. It's actually Bayesian can be considered as a special case of that uh, approach. Okay, so uh, in in summary, we have uh, three key challenges in inverse problem: high-dimensional parameter state, inverse problem. The fourth problem is very expensive. And then high dimensional parameter space where you know the curves of, uh, curves of dimensionality, right? So D3. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a, a few of our work on these directions, and some of them combine. I remember that not by directions, not by reduction, we combine both reduction in the parameters and also the states. Uh, futures is the, the statistical framework that I just showed you to, to completely to hopefully remove. The realization in the active subspace direction informed by the data. We don't want to do it, right? And this method automatically does that. At least in the linear case, we can prove. And we are investigating your machine learning. Everybody do machine learning. And I think it's interesting, but I think there's a lot of rooms. And they have uh, students working on that and, and see how we can actually make it work for, for scientific computing, right? Not only do like classification where you know the machine learning works very well, but scientific computing is a little bit more challenging, right? Where you actually, for example, if you want to conserve mass and momentum, if you want diversion free uh, uh, field, right? If you want to make prediction, if you want to satisfy these conditions at the same time, that's actually challenging. And, and we have some idea. Thank you. Yes. How do you uh, compute, and you use your actor subspace approach, you have to compute this, uh, this integral over your parameter space? Mm -hmm. um, I assume you do that by sampling um, in some sense. So you're probably going to sample somewhere around your uh, initial guess for your optimization problem. And then how do you know that the actor subspace that you compute kind of in that region is going to be useful near the actual optimal solution? Very good, very good question. Actually, I, I, I slip in the part. Right? I show you the exact thing here. Yes, I mean, this integral is actually, even in high dimension, notice this is the, the prior here, right? So we average, we, we compute this using Monte Carlo uh, technique, right? And, uh, and in general, well, there's no way that we can guarantee. Um, of course, in the limit, when the number of samples goes to infinity, yes, we can guarantee. But in general, we have, we have error bounds. In the paper, we have error bounds. You're going to do, actually, what you get is approximate uh, uh, eigenspace, approximate eigenvalue, right? And we, have, we can measure the difference between the, uh, the, the, the exact subspace and the, the approximate subspace in terms of number of samples. 
right? So, so that's what we can do. And then, yeah, you are exactly right. We have example. There, there's no way to, to do this one exactly. Yeah. And and uh, we have some guarantee in terms of error bounds, but uh, uh, in practice, uh, and the error bound itself actually has some constant that we, we cannot estimate. So in theory, uh, it looks nice, but in practice, uh, it's also work well. But uh, if you ask me how you are, how you guarantee, I, I, well, I would say no. I'm not, we are not sure unless the number of sample go to become very large, which we try to avoid. Yeah. Notice that is notice that we sampled from the prior. So that's that's another thing, right? We're not sampled from posterior. Some some of the researcher sampled it from posterior, which is very expensive. This is prior, so that's that's still fine. But the only cost thing is that costly is to, to do gradient of this one, right? So we do action technique or AD, but uh, but the sampling is actually cheap. In terms of compute, computing the gradient is actually not cheap because you have to solve BD. Yeah, I was gonna say, so to compute those gradients, you still have to do a forward solve and an action solve, right? Yes, because you can exactly, that. you are. And how many in your, uh, in, to get your two-dimensional subspace in this case, out of 100, how many samples did you use? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I, I forgot, I, I, I can open the, 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 the paper, I forgot, I forgot. It's the words a long time ago, but uh, uh, we don't do much. I don't think we do a lot, maybe a hundred or less. But, but yeah, I, I show you paper later, or I can look at it. No, not big, so, yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> With the, um, your one approach where essentially you uh, split the domain, where you essentially removed it uh, in locations of high uncertainty, does that actual, which you had some approaches where you just randomly selected, is that actual selection of that new boundary, does that induce any additional uncertainty that you consider into your actual inversion? Um, do, you, are you, do you like Monte Carlo the actual boundary as well? No, that, that's, that's a good question, right? So uh, right now what we do is actually again heuristic, right? So we just say, okay, this is uncertainty that I can deal with, right? Anything above that, I'm gonna throw it away, right? So uh, we, we do it in a heuristic way, so uh, we can address. You see that actually this doesn't match this region at all. So we pick an uncertainty where above which we said that we we not acceptable, and so we throw it uh, away. Okay. So question. Your question is that if you do this, we will introduce the extra uncertainty. Okay. I cannot answer your question in a theoretical sense because actually this is one of the methods that we don't have theoretical uh, guarantee, right? But intuitively and also numerically. It turns out that doing this, right, because you throw a huge amount of parameter here and you replay with one dimension. You see that this region is a two dimensional parameter space when you throw away, right? And you replay with the one dimensional parameter space here. So you invert for this part of the parameters and also a little one dimensional parameter space here. And, and intuitively, you would get better, right? Less uncertainty, like I showed you uh, before. In fact, you, you see that uh, here, right? You see that we have a less uncertainty. But this, if you do everything in the full domain, you have very high uncertainty compared to this is the mean and this is low uncertainty. This is like minus two sigma plus two sigma, and you see that we have a less uncertainty. Uh, I live in America. Okay, I cannot answer. Uh, in the, in the, there's no theoretical guarantee, but I live intuitively and and, and uh, numerically we can observe what you just asked. Very good question. 